Welcome to the Centurion 360 Podcast with PR marketing and crisis management expert, Michael Barolo. And welcome to the Centurion 360 Podcast. I am still your host, Michael Bellello. This is episode two, making me a repeat offender. If you're joining us for the first time, welcome. If you're back for a, a second time, uh, welcome back. A little bit about this podcast for those of you who are new, uh, the genesis of which is a public relations, marketing, advertising, and crisis management agency that I founded at the age of 27 with less than $500. And with the help of some uh, proficient professionals, I built Centurion Strategies into a very successful agency participating in three sectors of business, sports and entertainment out in Los Angeles, uh, public and private corporate branding, startup and launch specialist in Tampa, and then uh, also as a veteran-owned small business, we are capable of being a sub or supporting contractor as well as a prime contractor with federal, state, and local government agencies. What I intended on doing with this uh, pod release, as I hopefully made it clear in, in episode one, I want to connect you with the people that, uh, that we've met uh, along the way who inspire us. We hope they inspire you, leave you with something positive. And uh, if it's you know just one person that we positively impact, uh, then we've obviously uh, accomplished something. But we want to participate in this podcasting movement, this information exchange, and we hope to, uh, to be a good steward in that regard. Uh, I will jump right into it, but today's guest is somebody who I respect, admire, always enjoy seeing, uh, really enjoy working with when I, whenever I get the opportunity, whenever we get the opportunity, and he is uh, Jacob Ullman, and he is the Vice President of Production and Talent Development at Fox Sports, and Jacob is somebody when you meet him, you immediately know he loves what he's doing. He's very, very passionate. I think some of that passion is going to definitely come through during the interview. Uh, he's been with Fox Sports now uh, with for 20 years. He's won five Emmys. Very talented. Very excited to connect with him. We'll talk everything about um, Fox Fox Sports. Um, we'll talk about things uh, related to Fox NFL Sunday. Uh, we'll talk Daytona 500. Uh, he'll provide behind-the-camera tips as well as what not to do for those of you who want to be in front of the camera. And uh, it'll it'll overall, I'm sure, be uh, a great segment. So I'm looking forward to, in a, in a few minutes, connecting with uh, connecting us with, with Jacob. And obviously, we thank Jacob Ullman for his time. I know he's very, very busy over at Fox Sports. Uh, but before we, we do our profile piece and we, we um, welcome our guest, I usually pick something out of the 24-hour news cycle, one or two things, and we provide our unsolicited, uninvited, uh, perhaps unappreciated <laughs> uh, expertise opinion, if you will, on the subject matter. And we, we sort of leave those of you who perhaps participate in a 24-hour news cycle, those of you who are social media savvy, uh, those of you who are in marketing, uh, public relations, we have a lot of small business uh, owners. In fact, we received our first email, which was kind of exciting from a small business owner. Uh, entrepreneurs, we take we take part in a lot of, of startup events, and we work with a lot of startups. So those folks as well. I try to I try to at least give you something of interest, um, if nothing, uh, a, a mild attempt to entertain you about something that's happening in the twenty four hour news cycle. And so on the first episode, we picked on a few things. Um, one of which was Cosby, and I'm not taking part in a pylon. I was contacted by CNN uh, and The Wrap to give my expertise as a public relations crisis management practitioner in terms of what Cosby was doing or wasn't wasn't doing, if you will. And if you remember, uh, it was more about what he's not done. Well, this guy broke his silence, and he did it in red silk pajamas. Uh, we'll get into that in a second. But So I want to just quickly pick up from where we left off. So where we left off... It was he hadn't said anything. He wasn't acknowledging it. Uh, he was continuing on with his comedy tour, continuing uh, to just sort of move on and ignore the obvious, which in crisis management is not not a good not a good move. Um, he was also being a bit obstructive, if you remember. Uh, I'm trying to recall from the first episode where he was he was being uh, obstructive with with media. He was trying to coerce them off camera, even though he was still on camera. I and mean, this guy's not gotten it right. And then, and then all of a sudden, yesterday, I'm I'm sort of just looking through some things uh, to prepare for the podcast, if prepare is even a word. And 
I see a video of Bill Cosby looking at me in red pajamas, and I'm like, I, I've got to play this video. If you haven't played it, play it. Uh, pause the podcast, play it, so maybe it'll put things in perspective, and I'm not speaking out of line. But before I do get into this, like I said, sexual assault, serious crime. I, re- I, I totally understand it. It goes uh, unreported, in my opinion. It goes underpunished. Uh, it's, it's serious. I'm not trying to make light of it. No need to say any more, I hope. Uh, but I'm just giving my perspective as CNN asked me, as The Wrap asked me, as a public relations and crisis management expert. I've never represented Mr. Cosby, nor would I ever represent Mr. Cosby or someone like him. Um, and my humble opinion, based upon these allegations, again, he is not guilty until he has been proven so. But I'm just giving you sort of my um, my observation uh, as a consumer of media, much like you are. So again, I hope that you take some type of best practice out of this. Number one, um, you know, don't commit the crime. Uh, but if you do find yourself in a position where something happens, social media and traditional media begin to have this volley back and forth, and this becomes a, a crisis for you or your organization, uh, I will try to pull some best practices from this horribly... Uh, disgusting situation with with Bill Cosby and and that's sort of you know I think of at least a positive out of out of a negative um so we have Bill Cosby in, in silk pajamas breaking his silence on sexual allegations uh we also have letters from some of the victim's mothers making a plea to both he and his wife to to come clean and there's been not just one but several uh, of the victims and victims' family members, so this mother making pleas that you know that there's something wrong here. Please acknowledge it. And so, uh, his response to this is his his response to this is to do a video in silk pajamas and not even acknowledge it, not acknowledge it, not one bit. He he basically uh, picks up a phone again. If you haven't seen it. Please watch it. If you've seen it, you know exactly what I'm talking about. And he does this very uncomfortable promo bit saying, I'm far from finished. I'm continuing with my comedy tour. Uh, that's, 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 that's pretty disgusting. So to the point that I'm studying this as a, as a public relations professional, he continues to do everything that you shouldn't do. Uh, it, it further proves that he is out of touch. He is completely, in my opinion, out of control. Uh, I don't know if he's following legal guidance, but if he is following legal guidance, then he needs to stop. He needs to go away, and he needs to engage in some type of legal process with the victims, with the with the justice system, if that's appropriate, but more so with the victims, and, and try to make this right. And I think if he did that from a legal perspective, then then I think people would understand that there's some type of process underway. But if he's not going that route, again, if you're going to listen to a lawyer, listen to a lawyer, but go away, uh, be silent, deliberate, meet, try to make some, some effort to connect uh, with, with those victims. Perhaps it's, it's outside of the court system if that's the case because we're talking about, obviously, and again, I'm not an attorney, um, uh, we've not sought any legal advice before we rendered this opinion, uh, but I'm not obviously an expert on statute of limitations, but if it sounds like it's outside of statute of limitations, that's his ultimate defense that this happened years and decades ago, and I don't have, I'm not responsible for it any longer. Believe me, that seems to be the case. Uh, then fine, then go, but go away and engage in some type of process where you're at least looking to understand the victims, where they're coming from, what they have to say, uh, and and make some some corrective actions. I think that's that's the legal that's the legal route that he should be going, but he's not. He's he's doing some sort of hybrid, if you will. He's not addressing it, which obviously he's being advised by an attorney not to address it. But then he's also not doing the right thing from a media engagement standpoint, meaning he's not addressing the obvious, and that comes across, in, in my opinion as uh, very egomaniacal, uh, becomes, he becomes very distant. Um, and when you're being accused of, 
of some sort of uh, of some sort of sexual assault that you're denying and you're asking the public to see things your way to to continue to embrace you to continue to consume from your brand then you have to at least acknowledge what's going on and as i've suggested with cnn and the rap the appropriate thing would be to engage in a discussion with the public so i think an ask me anything uh would be a way to go an ama a reddit ama uh to 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 clear up explain to us why aren't you fully engaged in a legal process which would then take you sort of i think off the off the circuit you would go away and we would have to respect that until the, the verdict came out um but why are you choosing to go this semi public semi private route and not making sense and and really appearing to be disconnected and self absorbed uh, and and to do so in red pajamas definitely not not the right thing uh, not the right thing to do um, again I think it's ego ego maniacal I think it's uh, it's sociopathic ironically those are personality traits that one would associate with with someone um, you know accused of, of sexual assault so again it's doing him it's doing him no favors um, I'm not a I'm not a clinical psychologist I'm not an attorney uh, I'm a science major. Political science, which taught taught me that unemotional deliberation and common sense often prevail, and common sense uh, should tell Mr. Cosby that what he is doing is not the right thing. Um, at this point, if you're if you're not willing to engage the public fully and address these matters and have a two way conversation and continue with this one way conversation uh, of ambivalence, it's 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 not not the best play. Uh, you should maybe listen to your lawyer and and go away uh, and, and try to take care of this off the radar, um, out of the, the the public eye if you if, if you even possibly can, and seek some type of of legal resolution, uh, some type of of uh, mediation, something. But the, what he's doing right now, from a PR perspective, from a crisis management perspective, is is everything that you could possibly do wrong. Um, and I think, again, per my interview with CNN, his legacy has been tarnished. Uh, if we are writing the, the last chapter here, the final chapter, uh, it's, it's definitely not the way someone's, uh, someone wants to go out and, and uh, be remembered. And if you say it's not about legacy, then you'd understand the way icons think. He's an icon. Uh, icons are very much so concerned about their legacy. And uh, we've had... You know the opportunity to work with some some icons, and they are very much so concerned about what people think. And if if that's Cosby's effort by just pretending nothing is wrong, unfortunately that's not that's not the right thing. And and like I said with CNN and the rap, this will go the route of Joe Paterno. Um, I think that unless something happens that I'm not aware of, or we're not seeing, he's he's pretty much toast, and he's an, an example of of uh of what not to do you know be open uh be honest um and and don't try to fool people because you're you're fooling no one except yourself and that's that's sort of the situation okay so that's sort of an extreme in my opinion uh crisis management scenario that i hope none of you find yourselves in um but one that is that is more likely to happen to you is something that could occur on twitter and when you ask me uh, how many, um, what percentage of, of crises start on social media, I, I don't have an answer. I don't know if it's 68%, if it's 90%. I'm sure some communications program at some university out there has statistics on that. But I would say to you that it really doesn't matter whether it's 60% or 90%. The fact is, I think most, I think too many start on social media. And so, uh, again, the Cosby thing is something that happens to an icon. Something similar to Joe Paterno. Again, another icon. Um, unless an icon is listening to this, you're not likely to, to pull anything from that except the things like I talked about, you know, being honest, using common sense. If you're going to engage the public, engage the public fully or not at all. But social media is something we live with on a daily basis. So it could adversely impact your personal life. It could adversely impact your professional life. And so today, uh, before we, we welcome our guest, Jacob, uh, Ullman, Vice President of Production and Talent Development with Fox Sports. I want to quickly touch upon something that happened recently in the media, 
I'm talking about the Keith Oberman situation uh, with some Penn State students, and leave you with some tips on how to avoid a Keith Oberman-like situation uh, on Twitter. And these are the things that we talk to our clients about. Uh, Miss Lauren Rentschler, who I hope will join the podcast in the future, again, who's our senior director out of Los Angeles. These are things that we we really uh, try to emphasize with sports entertainment clients because they are so popular on social media. And especially when you're doing uh, rookie orientations, uh, you you really want to impress upon them the importance of of understanding social media, understanding that when you have 300 followers, that those are th- that's that's three those are that's 300 people. Think of a room filled with 300 people. Think about what that looks like, what that feels like if you're on a center stage and there are 300 people in a room. Think about that. M- understand that that's not just a number on Twitter. Those are 300 people who are followed by 80, 90, 100, uh, 60 million people like like Justin Bieber and his believers. My point is understand that that's not just a number. And I know that sounds obvious, but people become disconnected from that number of Twitter followers. They, they see it just as a number. They don't think about it in the physical sense. So what we say to our clients, uh, we say, remember, that's not just a number those are actual people. And if you wouldn't say that to actual people in the physical realm, do not say it in the virtual realm. Don't say it on Twitter. And and this is something that I think Mr. Oberman, and since he's apologized, I'm not beating up on him. He actually did the right thing from a crisis manager standpoint. He, he came forward and said he was wrong, admitted he was wrong, apologized. ESPN uh, suspended him. He took his punishment and came back. So that's he handled it the right way. I'm talking about um, what not to do, how to avoid the situation. Let's go into it real quick if you're not familiar. So Keith Oberman, as you know, very well-known media personality, uh, received a tweet from Penn State fans who are raising money for pediatric cancer. And I'm going to say that again, raising money for pediatric cancer, okay? And he didn't understand uh, the tweet, or at least that's, that's sort of what he said. But he received this tweet, this tweet from, from a Penn State student Again, raising money for pediatric cancer. I can't say that enough either. And basically responded to her because she said something about something to the effect of, and, and don't kill me if I get this wrong, we are Penn State. And then there was a link. And if you clicked on the link, you went to the the charitable effort to, again, raise awareness and funds for pediatric cancer. Very noble effort. And Keith Overman misunderstood, thought that this student was coming at him saying we are Penn State because he was previously critical of the Penn State situation involving uh, Jerry Sandusky, who wasn't, and misunderstood it because, again, according to him, he did not click on the link, so he didn't understand what the tweet was about. And he trashed this uh, this Penn State student, called the student pitiful, and uh, this later resulted in... ESPN spending him uh, from his show for four days. Again, Oberman says he did not read the link that was included in the tweet. Somebody directed at him and therefore thought that they were attacking him instead of supporting uh, this charitable ef- effort. And he he sort of lashed out. Uh, and he said, and I quote, I just went back at somebody and they weren't even throwing punches. So uh, how do you avoid being a Keith Oberman at his expense? Well, first of all, remember, let's put things into context on Twitter. Um, The number of Twitter followers you have, it's not just a number. Think of it in the physical realm. Try to imagine if you have 100 followers, if you have 300 followers, if you have 3,000 followers, 3 million followers, whatever it is, think of those people in the physical realm. Think of them in a room with you. And before you tweet something, if you wouldn't do that, in, in, in their presence, in their physical presence, then don't do it on Twitter. Listen, I'm guilty of it as well. I do stuff all the time that I sometimes uh, regret from a, from a social media standpoint. We all do. But it's funny how you'll keep yourself from making that mistake if you think of those people, that, that number of Twitter followers in the physical sense. Uh, so again, that number, try to put people to those numbers and don't just think of it as just a Twitter number, okay? 
uh, common sense. That's just common sense. And the other thing about Twitter, remember something, Twitter is confining your ability to communicate. It's limiting your numbers. And so sometimes the context gets lost, right? Because content often drives context. And so if you're already relegated to a, a certain amount of, of characters to fit into a tweet, then you're going to lose some context uh, because you're, again, giving up on content. So if you read this and it's not clear to you, it's not going to be clear to anybody else, okay? Furthermore, even if it is clear to you, it does not mean that it's going to be clear to anyone else. So try to take a step back. Try to read your, your, your tweet before you send it out there and maybe even ask somebody if you're around them to read it for you to, to make sure that you're being clear because quite often, not saying that this, was, uh, this relates to the Oprah situation, but again, another best practice with Twitter, quite often things are taken out of context on Twitter and uh, we're guilty of it on social media. The media is guilty of it for picking it up on social media. So if I could leave another tip, that's just, again, make sure that you're keeping things in, in context. Um, if you're going, if you get a tweet with a link, click on the link. Now, this directly relates, relates to Mr. Oberman. Uh, again, according to, to his reasoning uh, for, for the blunder, for the mistake, is that he didn't click on the link. And so what I'm saying to you is that if you're going to retweet something, click on the link. If you receive a tweet that says, uh, I love puppies, and you're like, oh, I love puppies too, and you retweet it, well, you better hope that that link links to the puppies you're thinking of. Because if not, and you have a professional account or you have a, a personal account, it may it may link to something that you don't want uh, somebody associating your brand with, but you've done that because you failed to click on the link. And in Mr. Oberman's case, he claims he failed to click on the link. So what I'm telling you is that if you have a tweet and you receive a tweet, you're going to retweet something just because you like what it says and there's a link attached to it, don't assume that the the context of the tweet uh, appropriately represents the link. Click the link, check it out, make sure it's what you think it is, okay? Uh, that's that's something else I think that that probably would have kept him uh, from making this this blunder. Um, don't mess with students. There's, this is the trifecta. If you're an if you're a professional, if you're an adult, uh, not again be age discriminatory, but if if you're an adult, don't mess with students. Students are learning. Think back uh, when you were 18, 19, 20. Think about that. Uh, think of if, if you had social media again, I'm, I'm definitely dating myself, but I did not have social. We didn't have social media when I was in high school. Uh, when I graduated from Florida state in 2001, didn't have it. Um, so I, I don't even claim to understand. However, if you have a student who contacts you or looks to engage you or perhaps a attacks you on Twitter, just remember that it's a learning opportunity. The same way if, I, if you go speak at a university or, or a college uh, or a school or a group of, of student athletes or youth sports, if a kid said something that was perhaps inappropriate, as an adult, you wouldn't go back and engage the kid. You wouldn't argue with the, I hope you wouldn't, the student, you would, you would I hope, act appropriately. So Twitter is no different. Uh, but he had a trifecta here. He 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 messed with students. Uh, he he messed with philanthropy, uh, and he messed with cancer. Like that's a trifecta right there. So those three things, folks, write those down: students, cancer, philanthropy. Don't mess with it on Twitter, on social media, because you will go down hard, and uh, like Oberman, perhaps get suspended for. Uh, for four days from, from ESPN. Um, the other thing is, remember something, you've got to pay attention to uh, the climate and you've got to understand, like you, you have to really stay in tune on what's going on and be sensitive to these things. If there is a, God forbid, a school shooting or God forbid, a terrorist attack, uh, certainly keep those things in, in mind. 
um, when you're when you're tweeting about things because you can offend people. And listen, in today's environment, today's society, you're going to offend. I probably just offended numerous people, and I'm, I'll hear about it. You're you're going to offend someone almost all the time, but it's really about context and it's about intent. And I think as long as you can reasonably, um, if you could reasonably justify, you know what you're what you're putting out there, what you're putting out on social media, uh, and your and your intention isn't to hurt or insult anyone. Uh, reasonable minds do prevail. If you're again in control of the situation, if you're not in control of the situation and, and things get out of control because of social media, uh, then I would highly advise you to perhaps take a, a leave of absence from social media or hire a professional. But in all seriousness, uh, to leave you with something from this Keith, Keith Oberman blunder, remember context, uh, put the, the physical connection and meaning uh, to the number of social media followers you have and are engaging with. Uh, because Twitter and, and social media in general is confining your ability to communicate, meaning it's limiting your numbers, uh, limiting the, the the number of characters you can use. You're going to lose context, so make sure it's clear. If you're not sure, if you're not sure, you're not certain that what you're putting out there is clear, um, and, and perhaps isn't your intent. Have someone else read it to make sure that it's clear, and that's what you intend. When you're wrong, admit it, apologize quickly. Acknowledge the situation, Mr. Cosby. Cosby, um, if you're if you're put on public trial, don't show up in in red silk pajamas. Uh, I think that these things will serve you well. Also, uh, if you remember from the first episode, when uh, Rick Langell, who's my former staff sergeant, uh, we had the pleasure of serving the United States Marine Corps together. He's also a head war gamer and naval officer up in Washington D.C. Uh, I'm going to be heading to his uh, retirement ceremony in a few weeks. If you remember, we talked about OODA loop, and that's something that they teach Marines. Um, OODA loop, O-O-D-A. So we say OODA, uh, observe, orient, decide, and act. That could actually help you create your own social media filter, sort of filter yourself, if you will. Uh, observe. So ob- observe what you're, what you're looking to communicate Um on on social media and and make an honest uh, make an honest observation of, of what it is you're putting out orient yourself so orient yourself with the current situation am i blatantly offending a lot of people is this appropriate should i be putting this out there what's going on in in the news today what's happening in in my life is this appropriate just think about these things i'm telling you it's a lot of work trust me Social media takes a lot of work to manage. That's why a lot of people choose to outsource it to an agency such as Centurion. But I'm just giving you the things that we think about. So orient yourself to that to that social media post. Uh, decide. Make a decision. Is this a good idea to put out on social media? And then obviously act. You could also use this um, in a in a receiving capacity. So if you're receiving a tweet, observe the tweet. Read the tweet. Read it several times. Orient yourself to the tweet. Like talk about context. Is this person saying what I think they're saying? Is there a link attached to it? Keith Oberman, click on it. Take a look at the link before you you decide to engage in it. Uh, Decide, what am I going to do? Am I going to delete it? Am I going to block it? Am I going to ignore it? Am I going to respond? Am I going to retweet it? Am I going to share it? What am I going to do? Uh, But make, make a decision. And then obviously act. That's that's pretty easy. That's that's more of a mouse click. But again, you know, go through these things. And I, I don't want to sound like I'm uh, um, being hyper hyper vigilant. Just understand where it comes from. I mean, this is what we do in a professional capacity every single day. And so, but this is what it takes. And it takes a lot of time. It takes a lot of responsibility. Uh, but it's also going to save you a, a ton of money, a ton of time, a ton of heartburn uh, if you create. A, a crisis on social media. And Keith Oberman is one example. Uh, Bill Cosby is another example, although his social media problems are being compounded by uh, traditional media. And uh, it's this vicious cycle that he's not going to get out of, certainly not going to get out of it wearing red silk pajamas. I think it is time now for uh, our guest. And I will do my best to do... Um, 
sort of a, a, a formal introduction before he joins us. Again, our guest today is Vice President of Production and Talent Development for Fox Sports. His name is Mr. Jacob Ullman. He's been with Fox Sports now for, for 20 years. He has won five Emmys with the network. Uh, I've had the pleasure of knowing him for, for years now. Uh, again, like I said, he is very good at what he does. He's very passionate. He's, he's, uh, he's a leader. And that's what I, I try to do. I try to connect this with people like Jacob. And I think what you'll, you'll see is that all of these folks who are successful, there is a, a tremendous amount of preparation. And uh, Jacob's someone who I think has been a student of, of production uh, from a very early age. Um, even though Jacob works for a multi-billion dollar uh, network, there's, there's still what we, we call an entrepreneur's mindset. And we talk about that. We'll reference it. Jacob epitomizes that. Uh, he's very resourceful. He takes action. He takes risks, calculated risks. He is uh, someone who is uh, very good at networking. He is somebody who is uh, highly intelligent, very proficient, and is always studying his craft and always looking to get better and always looking to apply new technologies and learn uh, new angles that can keep Fox Sports at the top of its game. So when you have an entrepreneur's mindset, you don't necessarily have to be running your own company. You may not choose to, you may not be ready to, but you can, in an organization, stand out and really make an impact if you have an entrepreneur's mindset. And I think you're going to learn very quickly that that Jacob uh, certainly certainly does. And so I think he'll he'll certainly share things with us that. Uh, resonate with those of you, again, who are interested in production, being behind the camera, as well as those of you who perhaps have aspirations of being broadcast professional uh, in front of the camera. Um, you know, He works with people like Aaron Andrews, Pam Oliver, uh, Terry Bradshaw, Michael Strahan, Jay, Gla- Jay Glazer. I mean, these are, these are all stars. These are the best of the best in the, in the sports broadcasting word, world. So um, obviously, uh, I'm, I'm very excited to introduce uh, again, Mr. Mr. Jacob Ullman, Vice President of Production and Talent Development, Fox Sports. Jacob, thank you for joining the Centurion 360 podcast. Uh, I know you're a busy guy, and we obviously appreciate your time. Welcome. No problem. Thanks for having me. I've always had a great experience uh, with the Fox Sports production team. You know, whether it's executives like yourself or the broadcasting team, it's obviously a, a top-notch uh, operation, and obviously you're part of that special sauce. When did you know you wanted to be involved in production at this level? Uh, tell us about sort of your career. It's, it's been obviously a very successful one and, and one I think that many people would like to emulate. You know, to be honest with you, I wanted to be a play-by-play announcer from basically the time I could have living thought. Like I was growing up, I was sports obsessive and in particular baseball obsessive. And so literally, I don't know, we'll, we'll call it the age of three or four, um, that was what I wanted to do. I wanted to broadcast baseball games. So my whole life, that's what I always said I wanted to do. I went to USC. I, uh, studied broadcast journalism with a sports studies minor, worked in the athletic department, and then was the head of the student radio station would do, uh, two weekly sports shows and a weekly music show, as well as play by play of our, um, football and basketball games. And it just, kind of worked out that I ended up getting first at a place called Prime Ticket, a production, it started as an intern and then a production assistant. And then summer between my junior and senior year, I got a production opportunity at Fox as we started uh, after we got the NFL contract. And I graduated and I said, well, rather than move to Iowa and do minor league baseball play by play, I'll I'll give this a, a year. And then after another year, I'll give it another year. And then uh, when we get to June, it'll be year 20. I'll be, I've been here for 21 years. So I guess, uh, I guess I'm done giving it years and I've just accepted that I'm um, on this side of the camera, not the other side of the camera. That had to be your introduction to the long hours. I mean, tell us about your, your typical day as a, a college student making the transition, obviously into the professional world, but you waking up at, you know, four o'clock in the morning and going to sleep at, at two. Yeah, I mean, you know, the hours, you know, we started, we only had NFL. And on an NFL Sunday, um, the times I've been here over the years have varied from anywhere from 5 a.m. to 6.30 a.m. Because 
The difference is Fox was really unique. It seems it doesn't seem like a big deal now, but when we started in 1994, one of the one of the big uh, changes we had to the industry is an hour pregame show before the NFL. Never been done before. Everybody else had always done a half hour, and people looked at us like we're nuts. Why an hour? What the heck would you talk about for an hour? Well, now. The NFL Network starts their pregame on Thursday for their Sunday. Game. Right. So, uh, it's, it's an hour concept is not very novel anymore. But the big thing is we were the only sports network based on the West Coast. So, you know, we, we, our pregame show would start at 9 a.m., which was, you know, noon on the East Coast. But starting at 9 a.m. meant, you know, basically a bulk of people will get here at 5 a.m., including the announcers. They have uh, a talent meeting at 5 a.m. on Sundays. So that's a, that's you know it's a big difference. So um, in my twenties, uh, I I wouldn't be going out on Saturday nights during the fall because I had to be here so early on Sunday morning. So it, it's a, it's a sacrifice, but uh, getting paid to watch the NFL is uh, probably well worth it. Now you've been <laughs> instrumental uh, in identifying and developing a lot of the on-air talent, uh, you know, and in my opinion, that's sort of what sets you guys apart from others. There's so many great personalities, so many talented broadcasters. Uh, tell us about those opportunities. Share with us that process. You know, you see someone you like, how does it start when you contact them or their agent and develop them up into, you know, a star that they are uh, on, on the Fox Sports Network? Tell us about that process. Well, um, in, in my role now, which is uh, talent development, um, I'm, uh, for lack of a better word, inundated with um, agents as well as people themselves sending emails, resumes, reels. Um, LinkedIn is one of the greatest things in some respects, but it's also one of the worst things in, for me because it makes it, uh, the pro is it makes people very accessible. The negative is it makes people very accessible. Right. And, right. Um, you know, the goal is to kind of uh, pay everybody with, uh, equal attention and and to be quite frank some of them probably shouldn't be starting at trying to get to a national level but you also find diamonds in the rough and you know you want to want to give everybody a look and everybody a chance um our, our philosophy with talent uh which kind of started with david hill and ed gorin who uh were, were the, the, the two original heads of fox sports and uh, david's still with the company and ed retired uh uh, probably within the last two years, um, is that you know, you're asking viewers to spend time with people. So it's almost somebody, uh, for lack of a better term and a concept, that you'd want to have a beer with and hang out with. And I think it all kind of originates with our NFL pregame show where uh, Terry Bradshaw and Howie Long and Jimmy Johnson were there from day one, and now we've added Michael Strahan as an analyst. Those are guys you'd want to hang out and watch football with and have a beer with. And I think that really separates us from others. And the other thing is, is and it's, it's tough to create, but it's chemistry. And their chemistry is real. Uh, the show behind the show is almost better than what gets on the air. The rehearsals, them hanging out. Saturdays, they sit and uh, have nachos and watch college football together. It's real. It's genuine. And I think that translates. So... You know, just take a football game. You're asking somebody to spend three hours of which is probably their day off uh, watching the sport they love. You want somebody to watch the game with them and talk with them, not talk at them. And uh, and, and if there's some teaching involved, we also, we call it uh, sugarcoating the information pill, meaning, you know, bringing it to them in a way that's enjoyable and, and, and not like they're at school. Yeah, and there's yeah, genuine yeah, yeah. chemistry there for sure. Um, and when you meet Terry and you meet uh, Michael off camera, they're they're the same person. And I think that because they spend time uh, off camera, because they're they're pretty down to earth guys and just a, a guy's guy for lack of a better term, that's why the the production is or part of the reason why the production is so special. I had an opportunity back in 2004 when I got back from Iraq, and obviously Fox has always been very generous. Um, and very respectful to the military. And for that, obviously, on behalf of veterans, you know, we thank you guys. We thank you for all you do by way of support. But uh, Howie Long's Tough Guys, I believe it was the first year uh, P.T. Navarro was, was producing that, and they came down to Camp Pendleton, the boat basin, and we shot Howie Long in, in several, uh, you know, different uh, backgrounds and his interacting with Marines. 
I remember we tried to put him in a Cobra attack helicopter, but he wouldn't fit in the cockpit. Uh, so that was, I thought that was pretty funny. But then after the production was successful, uh, PT was gracious enough to invite us down to the studio to watch the pregame. And uh, that was tremendous. We arrive at the Fox Studios uh, at Pico, and obviously that's very impressive. Uh, I believe I was 23 at the time. And I, I walk in and they say, hey, listen, we'd like you guys to be part of the intro of the show because we were all in our, our dress uh, our dress uniform. And before I went on camera, uh, I quickly went to the restroom and I went to the urinal and I'm you know, using the urinal, urinal. And when you're using the urinal, you sort of have your blinders on and I'm, I'm not paying attention to what's going on. And I hear someone walk in behind me and I get pushed. I get someone pushes me from behind into the urinal. And I'm like, what is this? And all of a sudden I hear, I'll kick your ass, Marine. And I turn around and it was Terry Bradshaw and he was completely messing around. But obviously he is hilarious. Uh, we, we leave the, the restroom, we're talking, you know, we're talking about uh, college. I told him I went to Florida State. Uh, you know, he asked me about the Marines, asked me about Iraq, and then he picks up a football and we start having a catch on set because there's obviously those guys are always playing on that field. Yep. Until this day, I will tell you, Terry Bradshaw has the tightest spiral I have ever caught in my entire life. I mean, to the point where you catch the ball and it continues to, you know, rotate three quarters of the way. He still has a tremendous arm. He's hilarious. Uh, tell us about Terry Bradshaw on the set. He has to be, he has to be uh, a, a national treasure. Okay, well, you didn't tell me there'd be any talk about urinals on this podcast. <laughs> and and, and that would be probably the only time you ever catch uh, footballs from a four-time Super Bowl winner. Uh, sure. unless, unless, unless Joe Montana or Tom Brady are going to come, uh, come through, this, uh, through your doors at some point. Absolutely. <laughs> Yeah, Terry, Terry is what you see is what you get. I mean, uh, I'm sure, you know, there's people somewhere that would think that's an act. It's not an act. He's he's a nut job, for lack of a better word. And um, I think there's plenty of people you see on TV where it is an act, where there's an on-off switch. But Terry, it's not an act. Terry is, uh, t- Terry's got a, Terry's got the, uh, uh, the, the country bumpkin thing, but he's also one of the smartest guys in the room. He knows also what he's doing. Uh, but but Terry has everybody in stitches at all times, and so it's it's not just when the camera's on. Yeah, and that entire broadcast team is is obviously very talented, and um, you've done a great job with that, and they continue to do a great job, and we look forward to the the upcoming season. I've not been able to take you up on the uh, the Daytona 500 invite. I may next year though. Tell us about that production. When does it start? You know, when does it end? Ideally, that's uh, that's a that's a huge production as well, huge product for you, correct? Oh, it's huge. And, and, and the thing that's uh, NASCAR and Daytona, just that whole sport covering it, we, for, we had 74 cameras on the Daytona, four, Daytona 500 this year. You know, it, it's, it's equivalent to uh, covering a Super Bowl each week in NASCAR. Um, you have, you know, for, take the example of Daytona, you got a two and a half mile track. So you got two and a half miles you have to cover. You have 43 cars on the track, so you got to cover 43 cars. And it's very unique in the respect that uh, every race in the Sprint Cup is equivalent to an all-star base, uh, all-star game or all-star race because if you're a Jimmy Johnson fan, Jimmy Johnson's in every race. If you're a Dale Earnhardt Jr. fan, Dale Earnhardt Jr. is in every race. If you're a baseball fan, Mike Trout's only playing if the Angels are playing. You're a basketball fan. LeBron James is only playing when the Cleveland Cavaliers are playing. It's it's very unique in that if you're a NASCAR fan, you'll see your driver every week. So um, it, it, every week uh, is pretty pivotal. Um, and and in terms of Daytona, it's not just the Daytona 500. It's Speed Week, so it's basically two weeks of on-track activity. Uh, it requires you know uh, leading up to it uh, over a week of setup and just getting our truck compound in place. And it's a major, major undertaking. I, I would say it's equivalent to a Super Bowl. And then the, the unique thing about NASCAR is it's the first race of the year. So they literally start with their Super Bowl. So it, it, it's, it's a grind to get through it. But then once you get through it, uh, it's almost like a little bit of a light at the end of the tunnel because then the rest of the season, you get into a little bit more of a routine. What's your most memorable uh, Daytona 500 moment? Well, unfortunately, it's not the most pleasant of ones, but our first race, which was also our first Daytona 500, was in 2001 when Dale Earnhardt passed away. 
And, and so we were also new to the sport. And the, the crash, you know, Tony Stewart about 20 laps earlier had this uh, what looked like horrific crash where a car flipped over multiple times and being novices to the sport we're like oh my god that's horrible well the way the cars are designed they're really designed to kind of withstand that so he was fine he, he got out of the car he was he was all right um you know dale earnhardt he, he hit the wall at a pretty fast pace but uh it didn't look to, you know a novice to the sport like it was going to be catastrophic but those that knew knew right away and it it uh we, we got off the air. We had to get off the air. So we knew he was going to the hospital. We kind of ended with a shot of him, uh, his ambulance going to the hospital, but we didn't know the results. Not too long afterwards, we were, uh, you know, building obituary graphics. We did a, a cut in that aired on all kind of all of our regional sports networks, as well as Fox news, just detailing what happened. And it was just, uh, 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 kind of a horrible indoctrination into the sport, but it also showed how serious and I think people take for granted the risks that these guys take and that every time they're out there, you know, anything's possible. Now, obviously, the positive is there's been uh, a lot of advancements in safety to the sport after that, um, and there still continues to be. Actually, uh, this year at Daytona on the uh, Xfinity race, the day before the Daytona 500, um, Kyle Busch had a really, really horrific crash where he uh, was about 90 miles an hour, went into a wall that uh, was not protected with what they call safer barriers. And in fact, they're, they just actually announced that they're going to make sure that there are safer barriers in that exact spot where Kyle Busch hit. But, um, you know, Kyle Busch uh, had, a bro I think, a broken leg and a broken ankle that he's still out, um, still out with injuries. And, you know, he's, he's lucky it wasn't a lot worse. Yeah, yeah. And, and some of those accidents, like you said, they're they're not always what they seem. I uh, had the unfortunate opportunity uh, of attending the race in, in, in IndyCar, open wheel racing, but uh, in Las Vegas when Dan Weldon was killed on the track. And you're right, there's sort of, sort of this this eerie sense that the pit crews and the drivers and those who are, have been there for a while, they understand more so than you know, uh, you know what's going on, what the outcome's going to be. And then obviously they take the driver to the hospital and you're thinking about the family. And I, I could only imagine uh, what's going through your mind in production. Had social media, had Twitter been where it is today, how would that have made that process different by way of you uh, making sure the, the situation was being accurately reported on? feeding your affiliates information. Do you think about that? And have you had any recent examples of how social media is sort of speeding up that process? Well, it, you, just going back to that, it, 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 just kind of your point, the one thing that was about pit crews and drivers reacting, you know, we had Mike, uh, we had uh, Daryl Waltrip in the booth and it was a really, uh, if you probably could even find it on YouTube, but there was, uh, his commentary was really poignant because Two things happened because that happened on the last lap. It actually, that happened between turns three and four. Um, Michael Waltrip, his brother, won the race, his first ever Daytona 500. So he has, you know, he's jubilant. But then conversely, he says, "Oh my God, I hope I hope Dale's okay." Like so, it's the the range of emotions was uh, fascinating. You actually hear him on air. You know, unfiltered and uh, in real time, reacting to both his brother winning and Dale Earnhardt passing away, or you know, at that point, the, the fear that he might pass away. Um, social media is is interesting. Uh, it's it's very valuable in the sense that it kind of it can provide us with real time feedback. Um, some of it, uh, you know, might be um, simple as hey, they mis ID that football player. B, uh, might be what you're saying. It might be speculating about injuries. Uh, and I guess one of the problems with it is now more often than not, it's a first to be uh, a rush to be first rather than a rush to be right. So you have to kind of take it all with a grain of salt, but it's definitely a tool that you can utilize. And, um, in a situation like this, uh, you can see that you know reputable reporters are reporting what they're reporting, and and I think it can help you find a story. And in a situation like this, you know, um, uh, you take the example of Kyle Busch uh, at Daytona this year. You, you we're we're kind of monitoring what people are saying, and 
uh, we happen to be kind of off the air at that point, but you're still kind of aware of what's being reported and you, t- you kind of take, uh, you take the, the credible reporters a, a little more seriously than, than the people that maybe have 32 followers and might just be throwing stuff out there to kind of try to stick. Yeah, and it's yeah. it's definitely made your environment uh, much more fast paced as if you needed to operate at a faster pace. Uh, pluses and minuses across the board, but I think the key takeaway for everybody here is whatever you see on social media and when something does happen is making sure you have proper filters and don't be part of the problem. Don't be part of someone who promotes and uh, you know continues to distribute. Uh, false or, or uh, erroneous information because it doesn't help anybody out. And if we're going to be part of this community, then I think we all have responsibility to make sure that the information we're pushing out, both from the amateur user all the way up to your level, there's uh, there's obviously uh, the onus of responsibility is on us to make sure that we're being accurate in what we um, you know retweet and, and tweet. It just It's just part of our, I think, our responsibility to make social media a better place because we all know that there's room for improvement there. Uh, to that point, Jacob, mobile users are consuming content at the cyclic rate, um, and we're gathering a lot of analytics as marketing companies, PR agencies, obviously, uh, we know Fox is interested in analytics as well. How is what you're learning about the the mobile user, the online user, how is that helping you keep this product fresh? How is it influencing uh, your decisions moving forward from a production standpoint? Well, I think the big thing that uh, we have a we have a product called Fox Sports Go, um, which uh, you can basically stream our our sporting event, stream our channel. Um, you're, you're authenticated if you know you're a cable or satellite user. Um, I think it, virtually every every major comp- major uh, provider now carries it. Uh, we just did a direct TV deal before the uh, Daytona 500, so. Uh, I think it's about 80 million uh, homes have access to it. And and the thing that we will utilize Fox Sports Go with is uh, beyond streaming events, we're going to also use it a lot for second screen experiences. So if you're watching a NASCAR race and want to see the in-car camera for Jeff Gordon, that'll be an option there. Um, in uh, During the baseball playoffs, we had a, it was a, a TV second screen experience, but we, we had a, uh, we have a web, a, Part of FoxSports.com, we have a baseball-specific uh, blog slash uh, website called Just a Bit Outside, Jabo for short, and um, we had a, a, a companion to our baseball playoff game where we it came from more from an analytical frame of mind where um, we had graphics kind of looking at advanced stats and also the analysis was more about advanced stats and included. Uh, manager Bud Black talking about what would be going through a manager's head in different situations that were happening in real time. So I think that the, the thing that we can really utilize mobile for is to give uh, to give viewers a second screen experience. And in a lot of cases, if they are not in front of their TV, give them the primary experience. It's just a different way of delivering the content. And as we're seeing more and more, that's going to become the norm rather than the exception. I look forward to the day, uh, not to be futuristic Michael, I try not to be that guy, but where I can put my Google glasses on perhaps and be in the dugout and have a dugout view of home plate. Please keep me posted when that happens. Well, give me two seconds. Give me two seconds. And if you bring glasses, wow. No, I, I have used Google Glass, but this is uh, the Samsung virtual reality. So we're actually kind of already looking at it. Wow. Tell us about that. Well, uh, it, it it creates a, a three dimensional world. You know, they have a couple of different programs. They're almost like kind of feel more like video games right now. Okay. And it's obviously a very uh, early try at it, but it's interesting enough that we got it and wanted to see what it's all about. Um, I actually went to the Google headquarters. I don't know about six months or so ago and tried Google Glass. Um, some cool things about it still. It's still got a long way to go, um, but it's interesting. I mean, you're you're looking at the internet on your eyes, and um, one one program I found really fascinating. It's uh, where you can look at a you know a, a sign on a door with instructions, and it'll translate it to virt- to different languages. So you know, think about if you're traveling through Europe, you can basically have this this you know device that'll help translate you know, basic street signs or uh, instructions is pretty cool stuff. So, um, I think we're just on the verge of it, but it's obviously getting closer and closer to being here. 
Yeah, and yeah, when I, you think, about, think the, about the advertising applications, now when I'm attending a ball game with my family, if my Google Glass is on, I'm assuming that there will be interactive advertising, smart advertising. But clearly from a TV production standpoint, I do look forward to see what you guys do with that. I know that you're always on the cutting edge. Uh, so if I'm a young professional listening to this podcast and clearly someone uh, certainly looking to get into production at a very high level, um, should should study your bio, should study what you've done because you've been very successful. Uh, you're well respected, very good at your job. As I mentioned earlier, you know, when you when you meet uh, Jacob, you you know that, you know, you truly enjoy what you're doing. Um, what can they do? What can a young professional do at this point to prepare for a career in production given the the technology advancements that you've seen well that, that's one of the fascinating things is um the 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 people that come here just out of college uh they have experience editing final cut some of them have cut their own movies they have you know uh vimeo or youtube sites with stuff they've cut like they're so much more advanced than uh, I was when I came out of school and I, I mean what they what people can do on their own and then you know I graduated from USC and the, the Annenberg school there they have a their new a newsroom and television studios are, are frankly as nice as anything in this business it's unbelievable it just it just opened in the fall and uh, I was actually on campus yesterday with a couple of our announcers um, it was USC Pro Day where the players that are going to going in the draft are, uh, you know, we're showing off, uh, you know, skills and 40 times for the for the scouts. Afterwards, I took our two announcers over there and we were, we were walking by and I said, you got to check out the studio. And they were they were they, they were like, wow, these guys, you know, people are coming in the industry already have this. It's almost like um, if you go to a school with that kind of uh, a setup, I, I would almost take that as you know, you'll graduate, you're almost a year into your profession, you've already been, you know, exposed to a working newsroom, uh, working edit bays, working, uh, uh, working studio. I mean, it, it's, it's phenomenal, really impressive. And I think that if, if, if people identify this is what they want to do, um, there's plenty of chances to get experience and get a leg up before you even actually get in the industry. Yeah, that's tremendous. And that's always good to hear because, uh, you know, obviously there's been some daunting uh, news about the economy over the last decade. And when you go to college campuses and you talk to these kids, there there are some who are dejected. They don't think they're going to get a job. Uh, they don't believe that, you know, the, the, um, the economy that they're going into is the economy their parents went into. However, I think the key is, like you're saying, make sure you go to a good program. Uh, make sure you empower yourself. And uh, make sure you, you study and, and obviously what you're doing in college does give you a leg up uh, or technical school does give you a leg up in your profession. So obviously education is so important and it's good to see that these, uh, these universities are, are giving uh, students the tools to succeed tomorrow. If the, one thing I would, the one thing I would just interject is yeah. um, as we talked about Twitter earlier, um, the, uh, um, I'll speak from time to time at college campuses. I'm actually speaking at Chapman University down in Orange County tomorrow. And the, the thing that is fascinating to me is the the people, the, the college kids you speak to, how educated they are in the industry. You know, they're asking questions about uh, rights for different sporting events and different sports. Um, I think a lot of that is through Twitter, social media, that if you want to know about something, it's so much easier to access now. And I think uh, as it relates to my industry, sports television, um, you can be an expert without even having to be, be in the industry just by paying attention to what's going on out there and following the right people and reading you know, the right publications. It's, it's pretty fascinating. And so um, I, I think that it makes it in some ways that much more competitive because there's people that are really immersed in it. And if it's what you want to do, I, I think it, you got to put the work in. So that's uh, from a production standpoint, obviously great insight, great tips from, from a successful person. Uh, for those looking to become on-air talent, what are some tips for those folks? You know, I, I would say the one thing, uh, I come across so many people that when you, you know, when if, if you want to be in sports, you have to know sports. You get a lot of people that say, oh, yeah, yeah, I'm a sports fan. But as you kind of know, you're the same as me. We kind of live it and breathe it. You can't, 
you can't fake it. Um, and it's, I don't know that it's totally a learned thing. You can learn bits and pieces, but you, you know, if somebody says Babe Ruth, I can say 714 home runs. It, it, it's, it's kind of inherent. Um, so I think it really has to be your passion. Cause, and I think it's such a competitive field that you can't really fake it because there's going to be somebody out there that that is their passion and that really is what they believe. So um, I would just make sure if, if it's sports or entertainment or news or whatever it is that you really know the industry and you really know the product. And it's really something that you're passionate about because I think it's tough to achieve at a high level if you don't have that passion because there's always somebody out there that does. Um, I think as you're getting started, uh, I think you got to be mentally prepared to take on anything. No, no role is too small. Um, maybe that means moving to a small city. Uh, maybe that means, you know, we have a lot more opportunities with digital opportunities now, be it websites, be it podcasts. Um, you know, some of it's creating your own, your own opportunity, uh, you know, I can't get a job there. I have a, 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 a pretty talented person. Um, who's an, uh, an on-air talent in Los Angeles, um, who's no longer doing the job they used to do uh, in terms of sports. She started a daily uh, sports news feed. They, they send an email to your inbox each morning that it gives you kind of like the top 10 stories in sports each day. Something she just kind of created on her own. She's trying to, trying to create her own opportunity, not waiting for a job to come to her, but kind of creating her own job. Um, it, it, be creative, be, be, be willing to think outside the box. Cause, um, you know, it, it get, our industry gets more and more competitive every year. There's more and more people kind of what I talked about people coming in with experience and credentials beyond what people used to have. And so if you don't come up with the next idea, somebody else will. And, um, you know, it's kind of a lot of it's creating their own, your own breaks. Um, my particular situation um, I started here, as I kind of said, in the summer between my junior and senior year, and we had a situation where um, our edit, our editing room was going to be done with the logging was going to be done on computers. Um, the, the games were actually going to be recorded on Laserdisc. At the time, it was completely, you know, unlike anything people had seen in the industry. And David Hill, who was the head, head person here, said, I, you know, I want college kids who... Um, who won't be intimidated by computers. I don't want people that have been in the business forever. And somebody at USC recommended me. Um, extremely lucky in that respect. However, I, I put myself in a position to be extremely lucky. I, I, this is what I was studying. I was working at the student radio station. I was working in the athletic department. So um, a lot of it is creating your own luck, putting yourself in a position to be lucky. Um, if, you're not, if you're not kind of networking, um, following up on any contacts you have, um, it, it, you're going to maybe miss out on what, what you would kind of be deemed luck, but a lot of it is putting yourself in a position to get lucky. And, 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 and it's also finding, um, as you network, um, there's a fine line between being persistent and being annoying. Um, <laughs> tough to exactly say where that line is. Um, it's probably some of it's a feel and some of it's who you're interacting with. Um, but you, you want to be persistent. You don't want to be annoying. So, uh, it, it's, it's almost being self-aware and being con conscientious of, uh, how, how you're, um, how you're, you know, how you're kind of, uh, pursuing people that potentially could help you a lot down the line for a job. No, that's great advice. <laughs> Is there uh, an internship program and where can people go to learn more about that program? Uh, yeah, foxcareers.com has our intern information. Uh, we do interns um, in the uh, in the uh, fall, spring, and summer three times a year. Um, they're they're all geared for college students, um, but those that are out of college, you can also go to foxcareers.com, and it, it it you know I think it's a process where you. You sign up for a, a login and a username, and then you kind of have access. It doesn't cost any money, but then you have access to all the job postings, and um, it's a valuable resource. You can kind of see what's what's out there. Very cool. And if they want to follow and learn from an expert on Twitter, they can follow you and contact you at? Yeah, they can follow me on Twitter. It's uh, uh, at Jacob U, J-A-C-O-B-U. 
Um, it probably won't be that fascinating. I, 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 I more retweet uh, than anything else. So one thing I do do is uh, I'll, I'll put, post or retweet a lot of stories related to us, to Fox Sports and Fox Sports 1 and also our announcers. So I suppose in that way there, there's there's some, some insight that can be had. And then um, I'm on LinkedIn. I believe my LinkedIn uh, username is just my name, which is Jacob Ullman, J-A-C-O-B-U-L-L-M-A-N. That's a, that's a good way to track me down as well. Oh, very cool. Uh, quick question. You are a music guy. And uh, if there was a soundtrack for a national sporting event, but just the outro and licensing and rights budget wasn't an issue, what would it be and why? Wow. That's a that's a tricky one. Um, something I hadn't thought of. Um, you know, I, I, I tend to uh, veer towards the, the classic rock. Um, uh you know, won't get fooled again by the Who with with its guitar lick and kind of its anthem feel. That's that's always a pretty good one, and and it, it kind of you know ends with Pete Townsend's guitar and kind of as it ends ends with a crescendo. That might that's what popped in my head, but you didn't you didn't give me a heads up on that question. And so I'm listen, it's it's a great answer, but because you are true to music and you're very knowledgeable, I think it's a great answer. It's a fair answer. Listen, man, you're an asset to the industry. Tremendously successful. Thank you for your time. I look forward to seeing you in Los Angeles this spring and summer. And uh, keep up the great work. And um, we'll have you back anytime, maybe perhaps before the football season, to talk about what's going on then. I appreciate your interest and I appreciate your time as well. And we'll talk soon. Cool. Thank you, Jacob. Thank you for listening to the Centurion 360 podcast. Follow us on Twitter at Centurion 360. Until the next episode.